Welcome. My name is Silvia Fernandez, and I'm presenting joint work with my colleagues Bernardo Abrego and Julia Danduran on the crossing number of centrally symmetric complete geometric graphs. We consider drawings in the plane of two different types, topological drawings, where the edges are curves, and geometric drawings, which are also known as rectilinear drawings, where the edges are straight line segments. We are interested in their crossings. So we define the crossing number of a drawing as just the number of crossings in that one drawing. So here I have one crossing and another crossing in this first drawing. I can say that its number of crossings is two. In the second drawing, I have one, two, three, four, five. So its crossing number is five. Our goal is to minimize the number of, the, the number of crossings over all drawings of a fixed graph. This can be done for the family of topological drawings of that one graph, or it can be restricted to the family of geometric drawings of that one graph. In my example, the, both drawings are drawings of the complete graph K6 minus one edge. And so my first drawing in particular shows that <clears throat> the crossing number of this particular graph is at most two. And because K6 minus an edge contains K5 and K5 is non-planar, then the crossing number of this one graph is at greater than or equal to one. And similarly for this other one, my drawing, even though it's not really good, it proves that the upper bound for the rectilinear crossing number is five and same, um, it also contains K5, so it has to have at least one crossing. And definitely we know that the topological crossing number is less than or equal than the rectilinear crossing number. And uh, it's hard to prove in general if there is a strict inequality, but we will focus on complete graphs and we will show that for complete graphs, this inequality is actually strict. Okay, so for topological drawings, again, our focus is on complete graphs. Um, in 1964, Harari and Hill conjecture that the exact crossing number of the complete graph is this quartic, this formula right here. The formula comes from uh, Anthony Hill's construction, uh, which is shown here on the right. And there's only a few values of n for which the conjecture has been proved. So this is really a very open problem, but um, the best bounds that are known, there has been a lot of activity, activity on this problem later, lately. Um, the best lower bound is very close to the conjecture values, like 90% <laughs> there. Some of the ideas that were used in the late, latest um, improvements for the for this lower bound actually come from the geometric setting. For the geometric setting, for the crossing number of the complete graph, um, a few observations. First, the position of the points completed determines the, the number of crossings, the edges, and therefore the number of crossings. So sometimes instead of saying the crossing number of a drawing, we say that the crossing number of a set of points. Uh, this problem is completely equivalent to the minimum number of convex quadrilaterals determined by endpoints in the plane, which is a problem proposed by Erdos and Guy in 1973. And of course, if you have four points in convex position, they determine a crossing. If they're not in convex position, then they don't have a crossing. So the problem is completely equivalent. Um, in contrast to the topological case, there is no conjecture for the exact value of the rectilinear crossing number, which makes it probably that much harder. And in terms of exact, va exact values, uh, they're only known up to 30, skipping 28 and 29. After that, everything is open. And in terms of bounds, these are the best ones. And as uh, you can see, they're pretty close, and, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And you can see that uh, there, there has been a lot of improvement in the last 20 years or so. And a lot of this is caused by a breakthrough result proven in 2004 that relates the number of crossings to the number of the so-called k-edges. So if you have a set of points in the plane, a k-edge of that set is a pair of fixed points that separate the k-points from the rest. So here you have a set of, of points in the plane, P, and you can take, you can look at any of, uh, of its edges, any pair of points, and see how many points it has on each side. So this one leaves two points on one side. The extension of that segment leaves two points on that side and four points on the other side. So this is a two edge. And if I look at this other one, then the extension of that segment to a line leaves one point on one side, the rest on the other. So we said that this is a one edge. Um, sometimes 
uh, we need the total number of k edges in a particular set of points. So that's denoted by E sub k. And sometimes we need to group them. So we kind of take the cumulative. So the number of at most k edges is all the zero edges, the one edges, the two edges, all, all the way up to k edges all together. As an example here, I have the zero edges of my set. Those are just the convex hole edges, um, the one edges, the, three, the two edges, and the three edges. And then if I want to take the cumulative, I have the at most zero edges are three, the at most one is three plus six, the at most two is three plus six plus 12, and so on. The last one is all the pairs, which in this case is H is two. So the actual theorem that I was talking about that is considered a breakthrough in this problem is this identity, which is actually surprisingly easy to understand. Uh, this is the total number of pairs of pairs of points, and you need two pairs of pairs of points to create a crossing. And we are subtracting the non-crossings. Uh, this is for any k edge, we're multiplying the number of, of points on one side times the number of points on the other side. And uh, this is essentially counting the non-crossings. So for our particular example, we have this counting just all the all the k edges completely determine the 21 crossings in there. So um, how notice that in this theorem, uh, we're going to use these, the, the, this second identity that uses the utmost k edges. So if you want lower bounds on the crossing number, you can try and get lower bounds for the utmost k edges. So the first type of these results in the chain of results that have been happening in the last uh, maybe uh, 16, 17 years is this one. So this is, the, this is a lower bound for the number of at most k edges, which together with that theorem, that breakthrough theorem, gives this lower bound for the rectilinear crossing number, which um, coincidentally, I guess, is exactly the conjecture value for the topological crossing numbers. So this doesn't really prove that they are different, but with all the other results that happen after this breakthrough, we now are at this point where the lower bound is way far from the conjecture value for, for the topological crossing number. So they're definitely different. And again, the bounds are closed, but there's still work to do. So not only have we been able to improve on the bounds, but also to understand the structure of the optimal sets. So in particular, we know that the optimal sets look very symmetric. And in fact, the optimal sets that are actually known, so you know, all the way up to 30 points, if I take multiples of three, they can be drawn completely symmetric with threefold symmetry. And in fact, some of them are contained in the larger ones. So this prompted the idea of studying the rectilinear crossing number restricted to symmetric configurations. And of course, we first try uh, threefold symmetry, but it didn't seem to help as much. So we just try central symmetry to see what happens. And um, we were actually able, surprisingly, we were able to completely determine this case. So if you have a set of, uh, a centrally symmetric set of points, uh, you can actually improve on that lower bound that I show you for the, for general configurations in the plane, so that three becomes a four. And what is surprising is that this bound is tight, which isn't in the general case, the one with three isn't tight, uh, but this one is tight. And therefore we can actually find the exact crossing number for this case, the centrally symmetric case. These are examples of configurations that are optimal, crossing optimal centrally symmetric configurations. These are just, any points on the curve one over x and their centrally symmetric ones. Uh, but of course, there are plenty of other examples. And again, what's interesting about this is that not only these are crossing optimal, but they are also tight. They achieve equality here. So what about um, the lower bound? I want to give you a little bit of an idea of what happened with the lower bound, which compared to everything that had happened before. Of course, it's informal on what happened before, but it's pretty simple. So um, for a brief sketch of the lower bound, I essentially have to make two observations. First, the proof is by induction. What we do is we consider 
extreme one extreme point, one point in the convex hole and its center is symmetric. And we have two observations. If we take um, kh or the most kh, and those two points happen to be on one side of the edge, then we claim that they are in the richer set. So if this were a kh, the smaller set is my k, the one with k points, the larger set is the one with more than half of the points. And the reason for this, that you know, if both of them are in the same side, then they're in the larger side, is because, as you can see, uh, this line needs to half the set because of central symmetry. So above this line, I have half of the points of my set. And I cannot have points here like this W because then that will take one of these two points out of the convex hole. So in fact, half of the points are on this sector right here, and therefore, which is completely above my KH, and therefore the richer side is here above. So the implication of that is that if I were to remove one of my, my two points, actually X and X bar, then uh, in the worst case scenario, I will remove one point for every, for, for a kh. If they're actually on the same side, they're in the larger side. So if this were a kh in P, it is still a kh in P prime, which is the one where I remove x and x bar. So using induction here, um, every at most k minus one edge in the smaller set is also an at most k edge in the larger set. So that gives me this term right here. And then the only one extra ingredient is that my, my points x and x bar actually participate, each of them, in at least 2k plus 1 um, at most k edges in my original set P, which gives me this other term. If I use induction with this observation, it gives me my theorem. And my theorem gives me equality for, uh, for the centrally symmetric sets, in the crossing number of centrally symmetric sets. So what about other symmetries? Well. Um, we were able to actually write on a specific and, and improve the inequality for the number of at most k edges, which is right here. And just in comparison to have an idea of how different this is from our previous results, this is exactly the bound for the general case. And uh, it is also exactly the bound for the centrally symmetric configurations, which is tight. The one for threefold symmetry is not. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one for threefold symmetry happens to be the same bound as the one for general sets, and so that's not very helpful. But for central symmetry, we improved it, and we know that it's tight. Moreover, for fourfold symmetry, it is exactly the same one, and it actually also gives the exact crossing number. And here's just for n equals five; it's not tight, but just to give you an idea of how this is changing. Now, as I said, we the, the theorem is tight for central symmetry, fourfold symmetry, and um, it is actually tight for any even symmetry, but not for the old ones. For the old ones, we know that it's tight only in this, in this segment. So the consequence of this is that we can actually settle, completely settle the, the crossing number for even symmetries. And the configurations that are optimal look like this. They are very like fractal-like. Uh, and you know, these are the first four points. And then the next four points are very much inside that set. And then the next four are way inside. So the, the, those squares get smaller and smaller and smaller exponentially. And the examples that achieve that, achieve that um, bound for, for the most k edges when n is odd are actually not uh, optimal because we can actually improve that bound for the at most k edges. So here is a second bound. It's an improvement for odd symmetry. And again, as comparison, uh, this gives you something a little bit better for the for the general case and for threefold symmetry. It gives you this extra term. It gives you this extra term for fivefold symmetry and so on. So this is an improvement after this point right here for k larger than this. And uh, it gives you this, this improvement on the lower bound for the crossing number. And we have one more improvement. This time, we're actually focusing on k larger values of k, values of k that are close to half. And this is the result for the 
crossing number for the best result that we can that we have been able to get for odd symmetry. Thank you. <laughs>